Um, welcome to another Haggerty Drive Time podcast. I am Matt Lewis, as usual, the social media guy for Haggerty. Joining me is Rob Sass. Hi, Matt. How are you? I'm doing well. And Stefan Lombard from uh, Portland in a different time zone. Howdy. Yes, it's, it's yesterday here. <laughs> <laughs> in more than one way, I'm sure. Uh, so, first off, and this may be bragging because I was part of this project, but we did a Chevy small block rebuild time lapse here at Haggerty that has gone a little bit uh, awesome on the internet, I'll say. Um, yes, and to kind of give you a little bit of information about it, because I, I thought feel you were like, going to say viral. No, it's kind of gone like bacterial. As the social media guy, I'm obligated to not say viral uh-huh. because it's. It's a four-letter word, yeah. in my opinion. Well, and in fact, it really, you know, it's, it's still bubbling up at just under a million, so it's probably, Right. Yeah. So it's not quite an epidemic, but, you know, yeah. the CDC's watching. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we did uh, 2,000 pictures total in a basically four-minute video. Um, 20,000, sorry. 20,000. I wrote it down right. Um, 36 hours of shooting, seven days worth of on and off. Not all of them were full days obviously. Um, and uh, it is going back into the car it came out of, which is a 1970 Chevrolet Impala convertible. Uh, and when it was pulled, I had 120,000 miles. And I will attest to the fact that you could still see the crosshatch on the cylinders. Like it was pretty clean inside of that engine. I was amazed. Um, and then, yeah, we're going to, once it's back in the Impala, we're going to do some kind of a quick kind of wrap up or end of the story video just to show people it's done, it's running, it's in, everybody's happy. Uh, oddly enough, the end of the video where it takes off with the fan spinning, it, that it wasn't actually running. <laughs> it was <laughs> the magic of time lapse. It fooled me. Right. <laughs> I know it was a lot of fun. Hopefully we're going to be able to do more of the uh, more of the time lapse stuff here in the future. We've got the equipment and it was a lot of fun to build. Um, Moving right on, a couple weeks ago we did Amelia Island, which was actually the topic of our last podcast that we did. Um, 99.1 million sold between Bonhams, RM, and Gooding, which was a good year for Amelia. Yeah, considering that the previous high was like in the 60s, like yeah. 66 million or something like that. Yeah, it was, it was pretty good. RM almost broke the previous by themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. $59.8 million, uh, 97% sell-through rate through RM, which is really high. Yeah. Like, without being, you know, the Scottsdale no-reserve auction, it's hard to get 97%. It really is. And this was RM's first sale with their their new investor, Sotheby's, Mm -hmm. involved. So I'm sure there was a lot of motivation to knock this one out of the park, and they certainly yeah, did. They did, and it, they everything was rebranded on yeah. the floor. They did an awesome job branding just from that perspective, but they had some great cars. They really did. Um, and kind of my first uh, ahas, I guess. Uh, modern classics, still strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that. Well, I mean, let's let's just call it the way it is. Um, you know, air cooled Porsche turbos have pretty much gone bat crap crazy. For sure. Yeah. Um, the one that alarmed me for modern classics, at least that M1 from Bonhams, the BMW M1. Why did you find that alarming? Other than the fact that it's double what the sort of previous going rate for M1s had been. Well, that's a big part of it. Uh, 605,000, yeah. including premium. Mm-hmm. Um, but didn't, didn't those used to be $80,000? No, I was just going to yes. say that these were 80 grand cars all day long, <laughs> like six or seven years ago. And it, I'm probably going to get taken through the ringer here, but it's not that pretty of a car. Which has been the knock on it. I mean, it was, it was uh, if I remember right, it was it was developed in conjunction with Lamborghini. I think Lamborghini dropped out of the project for it fairly early on. But it is, you know, it is very Germanic. You know, I mean, there's mm-hmm. some there's some 850i in the front of the car, and and you know, but it, it's kind of got that sort of generic mid-engine supercar look to it, and it carries on into the interior, which was really sort of the other yeah. knock on the car is that you get inside of it, and it's really not immediately apparent that you're not sitting in, say, like a like an E30 
uh, three series or something like that. It is very much sort of same gauge, you know, typeface, <coughs> switch gear, and all that stuff. Yeah, the this has got to be just a. It's a BMW. Mm -hmm. it, the the amount realized, value wise, and and B. It was just so out of the box for them, and it's unique. Not a lot of them were made, right? True. So, looking beyond aesthetics, it is a high performance car that was weird, both in in the time period it was released and that BMW released it. Yeah, and this is by no means they look better in person. It's by no means a bad looking car at all. The BMW Turbo mid engine show car from the I think about seventy two seventy three was a more dramatic. <laughs> more interesting looking car, but there's a lot of that car in this car, and it's it's not by any means uh, a, a bad looking car, it's just, it doesn't have really sort of the, the you know, the, the over the top wow factor of, of say a Ferrari Berlinetta Boxer, or a Lamborghini Mira, or a Maserati Bora, or something like that. Yeah, so that, I mean, that's why it was astounding to me, 605,000 is for an 80s BMW, and even though it was the best BMW they've produced mm -hmm. in the 80s, it's still, man. That's a chunk yeah, of change. That's a, that's a lot of damn money. That was 507 money not that long yeah. ago. So, all right. <clears throat> so another modern classic. And I was in the room at RM for this one, and it went crazy as well. 2007 Ferrari 599 GTB. Mm -hmm. Notable thing on this, it is actually six -speed manual. a three-pedal six-speed manual. Yeah. Um, and thought of quite a bit as the last good analog Ferrari or the final analog Ferrari. Um, 682,000, including premiums. Their estimate was like two to three. Yeah, it 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 it's what two oh. and a half times the pre-sale estimate is pretty amazing. Yeah. Based pretty much solely on the fact that it had a conventional manual transmission, which I, I note Ferrari no longer. Yep. Yeah. So you think anyone there is getting the message? I hope that they're getting the message of like, well, maybe we should just throw one or two in this yeah. year and see how they go um but it it made my my heart happy to see a, a yeah. manual transmission go bonkers at auction mine too I mean, what do you think stefan um <clears throat> yeah it's uh, I, I hadn't heard about the results um uh, but it's definitely surprising and it i think it really speaks to the craving that enthusiasts still have because even a, a 599 with paddle shifters is an enthusiast car mm -hmm. but this sort of one-ups that uh, uh, um, and people it's to um, to keep that connection to Ferraris of the past um, that were only three pedal cars yeah why is it that that you know that action in the secondary market doesn't translate into the new car market? I mean, uh, you know, I I'm the owner of of a three series BMW station wagon with a five speed, which they yeah. didn't sell very many of, and I paid a, a pretty good premium for it based on the five speed. Why is it that that you know in in the you know the new car market that desirability doesn't attach to a manual transmission? I don't understand that. I don't quite follow. And to be honest. Um, I think it's laziness. Is it? Is it that people are looking for these cars are the enthusiasts, and that's why companies like Mini are the only ones seeing year-over-year -year growth with manual transmissions? Yeah, uh, you, you may be right. I mean, it's it's a it's a really thin market, but you know the other three people who want a manual transmission <laughs> station wagon really want it, and you know that's that's sort of the way it is. Yeah. It's just not a big enough niche for the manufacturers to care about, I guess. I really wish it was, though, because there is something extra to being connected to the road and the car in the way that you're selecting the gear. And I think it makes you a more attentive driver. I think honest. it does, too. It sure as hell makes it harder to text while driving. Right. You've got to... That, that, is, that is very certain. Or drink or, you know, check yourself out in the mirror or whatever. Drink anything you're not supposed to be doing when right. you've got to worry about... You Drinking know, sodas. Upshifting or downshifting. Yeah. Down um, and then, Rob, you touched on this for a second. Air-cooled turbo Porsches are nuts. Yeah, uh, absolutely, completely insane. It does not matter what flavor. 930, 964, 993, as long as, you know, is, is, it's air-cooled, mm -hmm. uh, people are just paying just, just 
enormous sums of money in yeah. comparison to what they were going for a year ago. And this is something, quite honestly, that, that we all, you know, predicted and saw, you know, we saw this train coming down the tracks a while ago when uh, you could still buy a decent 930 for thirty five or $40,000, just saying that, that that really is not cheap. likely to, yeah, yeah. That, that's not likely to go on forever. And it just seems like overnight, these things have just gone insane. Yeah. I would say within the last year, year and a half, yeah. is when we saw this boom of, holy cow, yeah. Money. And although Jesse Polarski, who is sitting probably 20 feet away from me outside mm -hmm. the store, will kill me for saying this because he's in the market for one, yeah. the smart thing to buy right now is the first of the water-cooled turbos, yeah. the, the 996. Um, they are, you know, high 30s right now for a car that, under the skin, is very much related to the 959. Yeah, and with these... For all reality, they're unattainable yeah. for, you know, almost everyone. Yes. That's the only place left to go if you really want yeah. a 911. Yeah, for the price of a loaded Ford Fusion, a new loaded <laughs> Ford Fusion, I, I, you can still go out and buy, a, you know, a fantastic 911 twin turbo. That, that's, that's not going to last. And, and no. I just I hope it lasts long enough for, for, for you to get one. Yeah. <laughs> that's, you know, after that, I'll help them break loose. But. Yeah. I just, I'd like to add that. The, I know that um, there's that saying, when the top goes down, the price goes up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in, in my mind, a, a convertible turbo, a convertible slant nose turbo is not even the most desirable package that these cars came in. Yeah. I truly believe that Porsche's 911s look better with the top up. I think so too, and for whatever reason, the you know the the hierarchy of Porsche snobbiness places a sunroof coupe at the top above a Targa or a, mm -hmm. or a Cabriolet. It's just it's always been that way. I mean, it's it's sort of the the whole you know uh, competition history. Of the 911, you know, the 935s, the 934s, the 27 RSs were all coupes. You know, so I think that yeah. that matters a lot to people. And I think that that uh, people look at the 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 Cabriolet is, 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 I don't know, almost sort of like poser's cars. I mean, the, the 935... If, yeah. yeah. If, if I don't have any other option, I guess a Cabriolet will work. Yeah. And, and the fact <laughs> of the matter is, having owned a Coupe and a Targa before, I mean, I can tell you a Sunroof Coupe is a much better car to live with, is without it? question. So, you know, th there is that, too. But this, the car that Stefan was talking about, this uh, 1988 uh, 911 Turbo Slant Nose Cabriolet mm -hmm. uh, Turbo, just... Absolutely, that's 363000 if I remember correctly, with yep. the buyer's premium. You would struggle. I mean, seriously, this car would have been sail-proof three years ago in the high 80s. I mean, yeah. it really would have been. Where it was looked at as just sort of this 80s artifact that a mid-level drug dealer, you know, might have owned <laughs> back in the day. That You know, when, this, when I saw this car, I immediately started humming the Glenn Fry song, Smuggler's Blues. I mean, it's just... <laughs> You know, that's the, you know, having lived through that era, that's the, you know, that's the, the, the image that it conjured up for me. But there um, is something special to it being a slant nose, though. I mean, that's definitely... If you like that look, and, and again, it probably works better as a coupe because it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's derived from the 935 race cars and, and everything else. I mean, to me, it gives, you know, the 911 design this sort of uncomfortable, you know, front to back sort of sense of symmetry. You've got the back fender sloping down, and now the front's doing it. It, it just... Mm -hmm. Uh, it's it's not my it's just not my thing it's not my preference but yeah I could see that um, so a couple other air cooled Porsches that went through Bonhams had one a ninety seven nine eleven turbo two hundred and ten thousand uh, including premium and then another ninety seven this was the one you talked about the awesome uh, was it teal whatever it was um, nine nine three turbo S last time. Yeah, uh, the Ocean Jade Metallic That's 993 the Turbo S. Yeah, four hundred and forty thousand dollars. That was basically hitting their high estimate. Yeah, yeah. Well, exceeding it by essentially the buyer's premium, the ten percent. Right. Yeah, it. Right. it um, yeah, that uh, that seemed like a really ambitious estimate to me in the beginning for a car that that is roughly the color of the Miami Dolphins pants. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but. Um, <coughs> You know, it's a Turbo S, and mm -hmm. it's the it is truly the end of the line for for air cooled turbos with the the 993. So, uh, you know, obviously somebody wanted this car a great deal, and it's you know, it it, uh, it was one of the the more uh, more surprising sales I think of the weekend. 
Yeah. Yeah. So last time we talked about, just to go through them real quick, uh, the 94 Porsche 964, that one went for 330000 Stefan, the one that you loved, the GT2, 1996 GT2, mm-hmm. 973.5. That is huge. Wow. That's good money. Yeah. And, and, and this is, I don't know, what are your thoughts, Stefan? This is not even a 20-year-old car. No, no, it's um, it's really astounding. The, the you know Porsche has does these special models, um, and they stick stick to their guns about limited production with them, and and the market is rewarding these cars. Um, so there was I, I no. Remember, there was no I 96 when we talked Porsche GT2 Final Final Edition. <laughs> <laughs> I know that when we when we talked about um, this this uh, the estimate before the sale, um, you know, I commented that it was it was nine five nine money, and and we, but we were sort of skeptical. You know, it's just a pre-sale estimate. Mm-hmm. Who knows if it'll re- you know if it really goes for that? But um, I think it's incredible. Yeah, I, I think so too. I mean, it, again, it's not a twenty-year-old car, and it's bringing you know what was nine five nine money pretty recently. I mean, just shy of a million dollars for essentially a nineteen-year-old Porsche. Yeah, amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So another one of your favorites, that thirty-two Ford Roadster, pulled one hundred and fifty-one thousand eight hundred dollars after premium, mm-hmm. uh, which was below estimate. I like a little mm-hmm. bit, not terribly, yeah. a little bit, um, but yeah. Just awesome car, and it did strong it's, money. I mean, yeah, for a modified it's, vintage modified, and it's but it's a that's a it's a very cool car. I think that I would consider that kind of a good deal on a on a me too authentic period hot rod with mm-hmm. great history, um, and just a, it's a real it's a badass looking car. Yeah, yeah. and uh, let's face it, you probably couldn't build its modern equivalent for anywhere near that. And for one hundred and fifty thousand yeah. dollars, somebody got a legitimate yeah. piece of history. Absolutely. I, you know, I think that was extremely well bought. Yeah, I I wanted it. I don't have the money, but I wanted it. <laughs> yeah. All the same. Um, and then I'll just uh, jump right to that Jaguar XJR9 that you talked about last time, Stefan. Mm-hmm. Um, watch that one come out on the uh, RM block, driven onto the block by Davy Jones, the uh, the original racer of it. Two million one hundred forty-five thousand. Good money. Of course, it's a, it is a full race car with history, '88 Jaguar. Mm-hmm. But what exactly do you do with it? Right. We had that discussion last time. It's yeah. going to be like that's half of your investment if you want to do anything with it. Yeah. Basically, you're halfway there. Yeah. Unless you want to just let it sit in your garage. Cool piece of motoring history, though. I guess cool piece of garage art potentially. Yeah, if you're really into it, but yeah. I could outfit a garage pretty awesome for two point one. <laughs> just sure putting it out there um, the only other thing I'll say uh, happened really and I was having a hard time kind of reporting this in a good light so I figured this was probably the best way to do it the only time I've ever seen this happen there was a small electrical fire in one of the cars the Seat at RM um, smoke is all you ever saw but they were on top of things. Max was behind the podium. Yeah. Had the fire extinguisher at the podium. Like, they're ready. Yeah. Comes over, <laughs> gives it to the guys. They pop the hood off within seconds. Yeah. Um, and the smoke's gone and dissipated. I, so. That was the amazing part. I mean, you know, well, there were a lot of amazing things that happened there. First, the Seattle, uh, you know, caught on fire. Yeah. Secondly, it was obviously a situation that RM had, had rehearsed for. Yeah. You know, and yeah. that... You know, their training kicked in. Max was incredible. Mm -hmm. Smoke was out. Fire was out. And you couldn't even smell it, you know, five minutes later. It was really, I thought, just absolutely remarkable. But it did not do the bidding any good. It didn't do the bidding any good. And RM did as much mitigation as they could. They said anything that was damaged by this, they will fix. That's part of the purchase. So not only were they on top of getting it taken care of, but they're also basically guaranteeing that 
yeah. no damage was done for the yeah. purchaser. And, that, and that's pretty much how RM works. But yeah, uh, yeah it, it, uh, it was amazing. I mean, I think it did about 100 under the, the estimate. At the end about of the day. It, it was still good money, yeah. um, but it was about 100 under the estimate. Uh, but, I, you know, if something like that happens on the block, it's completely understandable that bidders aren't going to be as hot to shell out the money. Oh, sorry. All right. All right. I will. All right. <laughs> Just it was it. after at the end yeah. of the day a smoking deal. Right. All right. <laughs> I so. couldn't help but joke. We're having yeah. a fire yes. sale. Hell yes. <laughs> okay, we've gotten all that out of the way. So yeah, um, I just you know I, I felt like it was it, it warranted some good conversation around because it, I've been to a lot of auctions. I've never seen any of that happen um, as far as you know cars end up like that. But they I've were seen it all my them. own cars. Oh, just yeah, yeah not. Any crossing the block. I was not as prepared when it happened to, to cars I've been around. Yeah, I wasn't That's either. Sure. But, you know, <laughs> hats off to Max and the RM team for handling it as well as they did. All over it. Um, yep. Yeah, so another fun thing, and Stefan, you, you saw the pictures go up on Facebook. We did mm-hmm. our first ever parking lot concours. During the Amelia Allen concours, uh, a couple of us went out into just one of the parking lots, captured some photos of cars, that were amazing that were just sitting in the parking lots. Yeah. So if even if you can't afford to get into the Concours, <clears throat> wander through the parking lots for a while because we saw multiple 914 Porsches. Mm-hmm. We saw a 356. We saw a, I'll say, I'll maybe preserved is a strong word here, um, still running mm-hmm. Sunbeam. <laughs> it was a little rough. Uh, there was a 2002 BMW. There was one of those uh, Volkswagen uh, Type 2 Traveler, the truck. Oh, okay. Vans. Yeah. That thing was the, awesome. The microbus that... Yeah. Yeah, okay. That had a truck bed. Um, yeah. So, yeah, what we're going to do is, going forward at these big events, we're just going to take pictures of really cool cars that are in parking lots, yeah. not on show, and, uh, and really kind of push out the fact that people are driving them still. And yeah. even if it's not worthy of being on the green, it's certainly fantastic to see. In a lot of cases, though, the line between what's you know what's worthy of being in the show and what's in the parking lot is is pretty blurred. I mean, yeah. and I'm glad we finally because we've talked about doing this for a while. I'm glad that, that we finally uh, did it in Amelia because it really I mean any place you go, it doesn't matter what the event is, whether mm-hmm. it's you know if you go out to the Monterey Historics and, and go look at the parking lot at Laguna Seca, you know wherever there are car people, you know they're going to drive something cool. Yeah, you know, I mean, I th- was you last year found the, the Lancia Stratos in the parking lot at Gooding? Two years ago, yeah. There and I don't know. I'm pretty sure it was a replica, but it yeah. was a really nice replica. Whatever, it was cool. It was gorgeous, and it was just in the parking lot at the Gooding auction at the Omni Plantation. Yeah, without a for sale sign in, which is nope. nice. I mean, it's the one thing that that uh, you know is is not terribly cool. Sort of the curbstone of the auction company, where you yeah. drive your car to the auction, put it in the parking lot with a for sale sign on it. Yeah. And, the auction company spend a lot of money getting those people there and marketing mm-hmm. the cars. And uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, and finally, I know last time we talked a little bit about valve cover racing. We did it. It actually turned out really, really cool. And not just from a promotional standpoint, but from the fact that at these auctions and concours, everything is hands off. Look, but don't touch. Um, and we brought a lot of come touch uh, with these valve cover racers. Come play with mm-hmm. with what we have here. And uh, and it worked out really well. Um, extremely happy with the, with the showing, but the part I loved the most was the adults were having just as much fun as the kids racing these things. Uh, it, if not more. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> and, and got to see some um, spousal rivalries, you know, yeah, uh, the that hit close to home. Right, the guy, you know, the the husband won the race, but the wife had a faster reaction time. Yeah. so you know, they each got a feather in their cap, and they were bragging that they actually won the race. Um, really cool stuff. Stuff we're going to be doing for the future. It's part of our youth advocacy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, getting kids involved in the hobby and and having fun. And it is really Pinewood Derby on steroids. Yep, absolutely. That was. Just so much fun to watch. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think uh, that pretty much wraps it up. We had a great time out there. Um, and, you know, 
just fun, cool stuff. Yeah. Can't wait for the next one. Looking forward to getting the old cars back on the road. It's getting to be that time yeah. of year that, you know, you polish and, and hope the, the sand's gone off the road and yeah. get them back out. Springtime. Do, do you guys still have snow on the ground there? No snow. Basically no snow. Well, but it's still know, dirty. Yeah, it's still dirty and gritty. But there's, you know, where it was plowed, you still have. I mean, the, well, the stuff, yeah, but. two-thirds scale replica of Mount Kilimanjaro that I had, you know, in, in my driveway of plowed snow is still there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's not as impressive as it was. So, excellent. Well, fun stuff. Thanks, guys, as always. And uh, if you have any comments or anything, feel free to email podcast at Haggerty.com. Tweet us at Haggerty, um, and we'll see you next time.